Good morning, everyone. For, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Adam Tucker. I'm the city attorney, and I am calling this meeting to order because our chair is absent, and, um, and we don't have a vice chair elected at this point in time. So the first order of business for all of you is to uh, nominate and um, elect uh, a chair pro tem for purposes of this meeting. So uh, at this time, I will entertain a motion to nominate one of you lucky souls to chair the meeting. How about Melissa? I'll nominate Melissa Rye. Make a motion. Do you second? Second. second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. <laughs> uh, the motion carries. Uh, congratulations, Melissa. Yeah, that's okay. right. All right. Um, I guess I'll happens in every organization. <laughs> Oh, you're back, yeah. Freed up a lot of oh, Now I get it. <laughs> now you got it. Now I see how it works. <laughs> and, and I just had one announcement before I need to run off to another meeting. But that is, um, I wanted to um, advise you all that the city has engaged uh, the law firm uh, Bradley uh, to review uh, the pension plan document to make sure that it is um, up to date and in compliance with current IRS regulations. Um, that we use, we, the city recently used Bradley to review uh, the MED pension plan, so I'm using the same same attorneys to do that. I just wanted to advise you that that work is in process and sometime after the first of the year, I don't know whether it will be the first meeting or probably, but certainly by the second meeting uh, of 2022, uh, I, I expect to be coming back to you with some information uh, about any updates that might need to be made. Uh, there's nothing, this, this, this review was not prompted because of any uh, specific concerns. It was just kind of doing due diligence to make sure it was up to date. But if you have any questions about that, I'm happy to answer them. Any questions? Okay, no. Right. Thank you, Adam. Sure. Uh, we'll also start off with welcoming Kathy Smith, our purchasing director. She's been with the city um, for 15 years and um, and has just continued to excel in every position she's been put in. She's, she is just wonderful. And she is filling that one-year employee spot. Thank you. Okay, next item of business is to consider the minutes of March 17th, 2021. Mm -hmm. Questions or entertain a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, next we'll start off with Natalka and Michael Hislop of Chartwell Consulting to review the third quarter 2021 and October 2021 plan performance, flash reports, asset allocation, and rebalancing recommendations for the defined benefit pension plan. Welcome. Thank you. There's a, you know, there's a lot there to be done, but we'll walk you through it. Um, if I could ask folks, if you want to um, follow me along or follow along with me in my comments uh, to pull out your chart Chartwell 930 performance reports. I think that might be, I should say third quarter performance reports. <clears throat> Okay, and um, <clears throat> excuse me, I generally start off these meetings with just a brief overview um, as to what went on in the equity and bond and international marketplaces during the quarter so that you can put the um, um, performance of your own plan in a little bit better perspective. And normally, I focus in on the asset classes that your plan has exposure to. So again, when I make comments about the performance, it's more meaningful. But if you turn to the executive summary tab and you go to pages four and five, um, that will have a lot of the numbers for what went on in the stock and bond markets during the third quarter as I walk you through that. And I'll keep it uh, quick, informative, and painless. 
So the third quarter turned out to be a red ink quarter for global equities, including the US. Within the US market, only large cap growth stocks and large cap core stocks, as measured by the S&P 500, managed to post a positive return of 1.1 and 0.6, respectively. So it was um, a harmful, if you will, quarter for equities, a bit of a pullback. Uh, developed international markets fell in line with the U.S. stock market, dropping 0.5%. Uh, but EM markets, emerging markets, plunged 8.1% during the third quarter. And it was a bifurcated uh, market um, in the emerging markets. Uh, China and Latin America were very weak. They dropped double digits. Um, countries like Russia and India did very well, but not enough to pull up the overall index. So emerging markets, if you will, took it on the chin in the third quarter. Bonds posted a flat to slightly negative return um, in the third quarter. Both the Barclays aggregate and intermediate aggregate index were up a modest 0.1%. Parts of the bond market that did the best in the third quarter were US Treasury inflation protected securities, which were up 1.6%. Um, bank loans, floating rate bank loans, were up 1.1%, and high yield bonds were up 1%. Long-term interest rates rose modestly in the third quarter, five basis points, from 1.47 to 1.52%. But that masked a lot of volatility that went on intra-quarter. Uh, the, at the end of July, the long-term 10-year um, bond had dropped below 1.20 and it finished the quarter at 1.52. So it rose in about six to seven weeks, 30 to 32 basis points. The, the bond market um, has been getting quite whipsawed this year. Uh, longer term bonds have suffered the most. Shorter term bonds up until October <clears throat> have held up better. And certainly exposure to non-traditional sectors of the bond market, high yield, bank loans, <clears throat> asset-backed securities um, are all in positive territory. Your plan has good exposure to those sections <clears throat> of the bond market, as we'll see. And um, it's been remuner remunerative for the plan, although they are the riskier parts of the bond market, so it's a little bit uncomfortable at times to have exposure there, but the plan has certainly benefited the last few years for having exposure to those sectors. Real assets during the third quarter, and that would include commodities and natural resources as well as real estate, also posted flat to slightly negative returns. Natural resources were down 2.5% through September 30th. When I give the October update in a moment, um, oil prices spiked very sharply. They're above $80 a, ba a barrel. And um, you know, natural resources were the best performing um, asset class in October and on a year-to-date basis. I'll go over that a little bit later. But for the third quarter, they were still slightly negative. And REITs were, global REITs were um, flat, and <clears throat> US REITs were up about 1.3%. Again, the plan has exposure to both of those, global and US REITs, and it's been a very good exposure for the plan. So that's what the market was doing. Now if you turn to page six, of that executive summary, we'll take a look at how the plan performed during the third quarter as well as year-to-date and for trailing periods. The table at the top of page six shows you the total plan performance, but I guess before I dive into that, I'll go into some of the important parts, and that's 
the money, the, the, the money part, the dollar value of the plan. Finished September 30th at $175.9 million. During the third quarter, there was $1.6 million of unrealized losses. And during the third quarter, there was $283,843 of net outflows of the plan, benefit payments, other plan expenses. Um, the plan's performance in the third quarter fell in line with the blended target index, down 0.9% for both. On a year-to-date basis through September 30th, the plan is in line um, with the uh, blended target, up almost 10%, 9.7 versus 9.9%. You see the trailing 1, 3, 5, 10-year returns for the plans are all in excess of 8%. And when Michael and Matt provide the actuarial update, uh, your actuarial interest rate assumption for the plan is currently 7%. And um, it's nice to see that for a lot of trailing periods on an annualized basis, you have exceeded that target, helping to keep your plan in a well-funded status. But I'm not going to steal any of Michael and Matt's thunder in that regard. They'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, down below the total plan performance, you're going to see how the various investment teams that you have in place do. So you have a global bond team. The global fixed income team was up 0.3% versus a flat index for the quarter and up 0.7% versus a negative performing blended uh, fixed income in index of minus 0.5%. So the, po the positive 0.7 on a year-to-date basis doesn't look horribly exciting, but traditional bonds are going to be finishing 2021 in negative territory. So the fact that you have a positive return in fixed income um, is really quite good, and that was really all contributed by your non-traditional fixed income managers. You have four Four bond managers um, that are part of the global fixed income team. Two of them, Lord Abbott High Yield and the Western Credit Opportunities Fund, invest a lot in high yield bonds, um, asset backed securities, uh, uh, CLOs, you know, what I'm going to call slightly uncomfortable parts of the bond market, but have done very well and have been the top performers in the fixed income asset class, both up around 4% year to date. Your other two bond managers, you've got core intermediate fixed income, which Pinnacle runs for you, and you have um, TCW total return, which is a pretty much a mortgage uh, bond manager. The performance for those managers can be found on page 16 of this report, detailed out for you, and there's also fund fact sheets at the back of the report on each of those strategies. I'm happy to go into to you know, any or all of them in as much detail as possible, or, or as much detail as you want, but I'd also like to sort of leave Michael and Matt some time to go through things. So um, I'll let you ask questions if you have questions on your bond manager exposure or any of the others. I'll move on to your domestic equity team, which during the third quarter was down 0.4% versus minus 0.7 for the blended target index. Year to date, they're slightly ahead of target, 15.5% versus 14.8%. And um, you have six uh, domestic bond managers covering large cap, mid cap, small cap, and also covering the growth and value space, so it's well diversified. During the um, third quarter, five of your six managers matched or topped their respective benchmark indices. Only one fell short, the um, mid-cap value manager, Harbor mid-cap value. And the detailed performance of your domestic equity team can be found on page 17 of this report. International composite, that was a little bit of a weak link 
in your portfolio down 4.9% versus the blended target of minus 3.9%. On a year-to-date basis, the uh, lag in the third quarter also pulled year-to-date returns behind target 4.4 versus 5.4%. The plan currently has two global um, managers in place, meaning they manage both international as well as domestic equity. You have a dedicated developed market um, or international manager with Dodge and Cox stock, and you have a dedicated emerging markets manager, Invesco Oppenheimer Developing Markets Fund. Their results can be found on page 18, I believe it is. I want to make sure I'm directing you to the right pages. Yes, page 18. All four of those managers lagged their respective targets slightly by somewhere between 0.3 and 1% for the third quarter. On a year-to-date basis, three of the four are in positive territory, um, but the Emerging Markets Fund was pulled into negative territory with the weak performance in the third quarter both for the index as well as for the fund. And then you have a real assets team and exposure. Your real assets team is one natural resource manager that they focus in on investing in oil and gas, a little bit in metals and mining as well. And then you have uh, both global real estate <coughs> exposure and U.S. real estate exposure. And um, in the third quarter, um, the real assets team finished ahead of um, Target, um, dropping only 0.1%, virtually a flat return versus minus 0.1 for the Target index. And um, on a year-to-date basis, it's your strongest investment team, up 20.9%. So the real assets exposure has been very positive for you this year. Any questions on the plan's performance? I know I went through it pretty quickly. Again, I'm happy to dive into any of the managers if you have questions. Um, Girl. Dodge and Cox International has been on your watch list. What's the status of that? They have um, improved this year quite substantially ahead on a year-to-date basis. Um, so they, you know, we're, we continue to watch them, but we're happy with their progress. Um, they are, they do invest some in emerging markets, so that's been a little bit hurtful in the third quarter, but they are predominantly invested in European markets, a little bit in Asia, meaning Japan, um, and their performance has improved. Okay. So. Okay, I'm going to move on to asset allocation comments, and that you can find on page seven of your report. And uh, the table there, you can see in the lower right-hand table the broad targets for your plan, 42% in total equity, 23% um, in real assets, 34% in fixed income, and 1% in cash. So when I say that your total fund composite dropped in line with the blended target index, that is the blended target index. So that's what you're being compared to. The table above that shows your actual allocation to those asset classes at the end of the third quarter. The plan is overweight equities, 49% versus 42%, and that is primarily because equities have outperformed bonds and real assets for the past two or three years. Um, we've been trimming equities, both domestic as well as international equities, and they keep growing back. So that's, it's a high quality problem to have. So the other issue with trimming um, equities is where do you put it? And currently we're less excited and more concerned about fixed income than we are about equities, so we're letting a bit of the overweight ride. 
total real asset exposure is 20%, so about 3% underweight the target, and that is all on the natural resource side. You are pretty much at target for your real estate exposure. Um, the um, Natural resource exposure is about 3%, 25 to 3% underweight. That's because up until this year, really, commodities have been a tough place to be invested in. Oil prices were dropping. Um, it, was, it was tough exposure. You maintained you know, an underweight position in it. It's paying off quite handsomely this year. But that's where the underweight lies there. Total fixed income, your underweight 28.8% versus 34% target, and that's really because of um, weak performance um, by the asset class. So, and then you are overweight your liquidity target of 1%. We've been running you the past 12 or 18 months at closer to 2%. We feel during periods of high market volatility, it's really good to have um, 9 to 12 months of the plan's benefit payments in liquidity so that you're not forced to liquidate into a weak market or a volatile market to meet pension uh, payments and such. So there's a little bit of an opportunity cost associated with that because cash is not earning anything, but bonds are negative and I'd rather see you in cash and have the money and your equities are overweight anyway and doing just fine. So we feel good about that and we plan to continue to keep that tactically overweight probably at least for the next year. Any questions on the asset allocation? Okay, now I'm going to shift gears to the October um, flash report and then we also handed out a table that looks like this just a front and back with the October performance update for the plan and I just wanted to go through the October um, flash report as well. So October for the month was <clears throat> the opposite of what September and the third quarter ended up being. It was a very strong quarter for equities, both domestic as well as international, but predominantly domestic, led by U.S. large and mid-cap growth stocks, which rose 7 and 6%. The growth style still continue to outperform value. You have exposure to both. And uh, international markets, developed markets rose um, less than US markets. Let me just, but uh, e and EM markets also rose about 1%. Developed markets were up about 2.5%. So that's sort of the backdrop um, in October for equities. Bonds, it was a negative month for bonds. And what was sort of surprising is that short-term rates popped more than long-term <coughs> rates. So actually, short and intermediate-term bond funds uh, underperformed longer-term bond funds. And um, so that was a, you know, a little bit um, difficult for um, your core uh, bond manager uh, at Pinnacle. Real assets, however, were top performers in October, rising 8% um, for natural, uh, excuse me, for uh, most REIT funds and 9% for natural resources. So both in absolute and relative terms, um, real assets were shining stars in October. Um, if you look at the monthly flash reports that we present to the committee, they look like this table. Um, we, you, all of the over and under weights that I discussed of, as of September 30th um, remain in place. They might have been extended a little bit because, again, equities outperformed uh, very strongly and real assets, so you're probably a little bit more underweight in fixed income. In fact, uh, yeah, you're 27.8. 
40% in fixed income. And your equity went up to 49.5% versus 49% overweight at, in uh, September 30th. We're still not making any rebalancing recommendations at this point in time. Your cash level was at 1.9%, so you have you know, enough liquidity to make benefit payments for the next 9 to 12 months. We don't feel we need to re raise cash at this point in time. So that's where the plan stands from an asset standpoint. Going back to this table, return-wise, in October, the plan gained, the total fund gained 3.7%, matching that blended target index. And your year-to-date return went from being 9.7% at the end of September to 13.8% at the end of October. So very strong results. Once again, your fixed income team all either met or topped their targets, and Lord Abbott High Yield and Western Credit Opportunities continue to be the strong performers on that fixed income team. Your large, your equity managers, um, you know, all did uh, quite well, um, but uh, led by your small cap manager team, both small cap. Um, value and growth outperforming their targets. Your other managers underperformed by a little bit, but still strong, absolute positive returns. And the year-to-date returns are, you know, pretty attractive across all of your um, domestic equity managers. And um, all of your um, international managers, except for one, topped their targets. American Funds Capital World and Growth, which is one of the global managers, fell slightly short at 4.8% versus 5.1%. But all of the other managers topped their targets. And as I noted earlier, the um, real asset exposure, your global REITs, your natural resources, your U.S. REITs, whether you're looking at the third quarter or you're looking at the year-to-date column, they have really uh, contributed significantly to plan performance, up between 23 and 40 percent year-to-date. So that's a, you know my conclusion for the plan update. You know, what are we looking at for, um, well, I guess one closing comment I'll make on just performance was, you know, uh, 2020, when the um, pandemic struck, um, you know, we came to um, the city um, in the second quarter reporting um, and sort of suggested that you add to some beleaguered asset classes, namely high yield bonds, and real estate, which were two asset classes that were horribly beat up um, when the, with the initial um, shutdown. And um, the committee made an investment in the Western Credit Opportunities Fund and also two U.S. REIT funds. And it was perhaps not the very bottom of the market for those asset classes, but it was darn close. And, you know, your... Um, inception to date performance you just you know really um, this in the third quarter uh, had your one year anniversary with a lot of those um, asset classes has really been um, extraordinary I mean the Western Credit Opportunity Fund was up 11 and a half percent since you put money into it and your global REIT funds or excuse me your US REIT funds are up 27 and 30 percent for the trailing one year, respectively. So you made some uncomfortable decisions at the right time, uh, and the market rewarded the plan for it. So kudos to you as a committee. It's not easy to buy low 
you know, the, the, the phrase buy low and sell high is easy to say. It's not always easy to do. Looking forward to next year, we are concerned about interest rates um, in the fixed income asset class. So we are um, presenting you with a short-term bond um, search um, today. Michael's going to review that. Um, you have good intermediate bond exposure with Pinnacle and TCW, your mortgage-focused uh, manager also has a shorter duration than the typical intermediate um, bond fund because mortgages have a shorter duration. Um, but we think that it might be a good idea for the plan to think about adding a short-term bond fund. Um, so, you know, we want to review some um, ca uh, candidates with you. And then also last quarter, um, we had presented you with a small cap value search. Your small cap value, Ceredex um, small cap value, has posted um, good absolute returns, but they have lagged the small cap value index. And so on a, on a relative basis. So uh, it might be time to part ways. You have been invested with them a long time, since about 1998. Um, so they've done a good job, as I said, in absolute terms. Uh, they had a good third quarter. They had a good October. So, um, you know, they're doing better. But uh, we wanted to just review some options with you in the small cap value space. So I will turn that over to Michael. Okay. Well, then um, I will start with small cap value equity here. Um, and see, is it just in the presentation? It is in the presentation. Oh, golly. Uh, it's like hundreds of pages. So. Yeah. And you should have books in front of you if you'd like to follow along in your books, but Michael's doing a good job of getting us, you know. Yeah, I would, uh, I would recommend uh, for those who have physical books to uh, turn to page three. Which one are you starting with, Michael? Uh, that, that would be the small cap value equity. Okay, small cap value equity book, page three. And um, here I've compiled um, a kind of a lot of the relevant information that we look at when we are uh, screening for a new manager. Uh, to echo Natalka's earlier thoughts, um, Saradex has done a solid job in absolute terms. Um, your patience with Saradex uh, so Good. far this year has actually also been rewarded. Um, book, you know. yeah. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Um, for the um, relative performance for the month of October was uh, quite strong, actually, at 5.1%. Uh, versus 3.8 percent on the uh, applicable benchmark, the Russell 2000 value. That brings year-to-date performance for the fund up to 24.8 percent versus a target return of 27.6 percent. Again, you know, fantastic uh, absolute performance, but still could be better. Um, and with that, uh, we've screened for uh, the managers that have, um, you know, satisfied that return requirement and um, also. Uh, provided in excess. So the three managers uh, that we have for you to consider today are American Century, small cap value, Invesco's small cap value strategy, and the Vanguard S&P small cap 600 value ETF. So uh, each of these strategies, they're, they're, they're unique in their approach to, um, to managing this asset class. Um, we have two active strategies and one passive strategy. Uh, with regard to the passive strategy, uh, for your small cap growth exposure, you're currently invested in small cap, uh, Vanguard small cap growth. It's a similar type of strategy. It seeks to just um, track the return of the, of the target benchmark. Um, for this strategy, though, uh, you do have a choice of benchmarks. And when screening, we, we chose to, to, to make the bar a little bit higher. The, uh, the S&P small cap 600 index, as you can see from this performance chart, has been the more difficult um, target to surpass, you know, annualizing about 1% ahead of the Russell 2000 value index. So we, we made the bar that much higher. And not only that, it's been a very difficult um, 
a target for near all active managers to beat. So the other two, Invesco and American Century, have, uh, have you know have have done so um, in certain trailing periods. Now uh, the other attractive part about these passive strategies is with regard to fees. Um, you know, the decision to invest in Vanguard small cap growth was was driven largely in part on cost savings. Uh, it's the same type of story here. If we look at the lower right hand of the bottom table, you can see the difference between the annual net expense ratios for each of these strategies. Um, all, the fees for all of these strategies are competitive, but at 0.15%, uh, Vanguard is uh, far and away the cheapest. That is um, not to say, though, that um, all of these uh, performance results are not net of fees. They are. So all of these numbers that you see above are the results that you experience after the fees are, are, are taken out. So. Um, with regard to the other two, American Century and um, Invesco, they are you know, quite traditional in their approach to active management. Um, the, the, I would say the difference is here, um, they're highly diversified. All of these funds, um, you know, they have uh, well in excess of 100 different holdings. Uh, you know, uh, concentration, though, is a little bit more aggressive. And what I, what I mean by concentration is that um, the percentage of assets in their largest holdings uh, differs widely between each strategy. Invesco small cap value is the most aggressive. That is in their top 10% of holdings. Each one of those top 10, excuse me, not top 10%, the top 10 holdings on average are more than 3% of the fund each. That is to say, if one of these companies were to uh, go into default and the equity were to become um, valueless, that would that would mean three percent of the fund. Um, that's another attractive part about uh, passive strategies: is the diversification is much higher. You can see here, for Vanguard, the fund has 481 holdings in it, and within the top 10, um, they average less than one percent of the portfolio each. So you, you, your money is spread out among a, a much wider selection of investments, and yet the index you know, continues to annualize uh, low double-digit returns over the long term, which is you know, quite a remarkable element. Um, other than that, so American Century, um, among the three, it is the most expensive, but regardless, it is also the best performing. So. Uh, it also comes with less concentration in top holdings. It comes with a lower beta than the benchmarks, uh, which is to say that um, if the benchmark is to rise one one percent, it may rise only uh, you know ninety six percent of that. If it were to fall one percent, it would only fall uh, ninety six percent of that. That is based off of res of historical results, of course, uh, which are not indicative of future performance necessarily. Um, so before I, uh, you know, just kind of continue on, uh, does anybody have any specific questions on any of these managers, or just any thoughts in regard to replacing Saradex? Been with you since '98. Um, I, I'm sure you know there have been conversations like this uh, in the past. Um, but I'll open it up to the committee here. Yeah, I, I mean, just a couple of comments that you know I'll add is that. Small cap value as an asset class, as a portion of the market, has been the weakest link for about the last two or three years. Yes. So even the indexes have underperformed mid and large cap value. Um, and it's been in both small growth, Michael mentioned that you do have ETF exposure there. And um, one of the finalists here is an ETF. Both in small growth and small value, it's been difficult to identify active managers that can consistently outperform the benchmark and that are still open. Mm. A lot of small cap funds are closed. Um, and including Saradex was closed for many years. I believe they've reopened recently. So, you know, well, one of the other reasons why the index shows so strong, um, or an index fund uh, in this category, is that it's just been very difficult to outpace uh, the index. So. I 
could also draw attention to um, the standard deviation of each of these um, funds. The, uh, again, uh, as I mentioned, Invesco being uh, the, the most aggressive of the options here, they exhibit uh, the highest uh, five-year standard deviation at 29.4, um, you know, significantly higher than the other two options uh, as a result of, of their high uh, concentration among holdings. And if you feel that you would like other or additional information, you know, in order to make a decision, you know, you know, you don't have to make a decision today, obviously, but we, you know, we wanted to update the the study for you. And um, but if there's any other, you know, information that can that we can provide that would help you make a, you know, make a decision. Um, Clarify me the funding of this. We're going to take it where and how much? We would probably, we'll take it from um, the Virtus Ceredex small value. It would be transferred in it. It's going to be about 6 million, 6.2 million is the market value. Let me right. look yeah. up what's in. Let's take it from which one? Uh, the Virtus Ceredex. Virtus, okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. See, yeah, six point five million dollars at the end of September. They had a good October, but you know it's about probably about six point seven million. With the inflationary pressures and interest rate pressures, does it give any concern of the allocation to the cyclical sector of the of the market? Um, I would say that. Um, Generally, value and small value tend to do well during periods of economic growth, and they can tolerate rising interest rates as long as there's economic growth pretty well, because the financial sector normally does well, both in small cap, large cap, and mid cap. Um, inflation um, will It'll challenge the cyclical sector a bit, Craig. So, but um, I think that you know, I think that inflation is going to be a little bit of a challenge across the board um, in equities that way. So, it could be a little bit of a hindrance. But I don't think any more so in small value than in some other parts of the market. I would I would also add, you know, in within the the small cap area of the market, you know, you'll you'll find uh, some of those natural resources companies, some of those miners and 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 um, ENP. You'll also find um, utilities companies, also you know, things like that. Um, those tend to do well during periods of inflation. Also, just as Natalka said, um, you know, your community banks and things like that in the small cap sector, uh, with higher interest rates, they they actually will have some more room for spread, uh, so that they can, you know, potentially make some more money. So, it's a it's a period where. For small cap, there's higher risk, but there's also higher reward with higher exposure to the cyclical sector in, in this type of an environment. What do you attribute the lower beta on American Century to over a five-year period, especially with the high concentration, because they have 21% of their assets in top five, hold, top ten, top ten holdings? Is that just management? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, the, their emphasis on uh, quality or stronger balance sheets within their companies, um, although they do uh, tend to concentrate their holdings more, they're emphasizing companies with more reliable earnings and uh, less speculative types of, uh, of investments. My tendency is to say if we're going to do this, to go with the lower beta and better return, but that high concentration bothers me that they've got so many assets and 20% of their $6 billion portfolio in a, that's, that's a lot of money and few assets. 
Yeah, I, I would uh, I would tend to um, you know to an extent I agree with that sentiment. Um, you know, personally, I think in small cap um, and particularly uh, within the value area, the S and P 600 value is a uh, is a tried and true and very difficult to beat strategy. Um, our our selection of, of managers that actually exceeded that with in terms of pure return, regardless of risk or concentration, was already small. But then to take you know reasonable strategies with a relatively lower concentration in top holdings, it slimmed down the mix even more. Um, you know the other thing too is to, is to think about fees. You know American Century. You know, they're, they're not only highly concentrated, they're also the most expensive of the available strategies. Fees on Vanguard are a fraction of theirs. And so that's uh, always something to consider. Your description, too, kind of makes it look like their longest ter tenured manager may be preparing to retire, since he just promoted a co-manager last year. Oh right, yes, um, yeah. For team turnover, that has been, um, you know, throughout the industry, uh, that's something we've been uh, keeping a careful um, eye out for. Um, any, uh, you know, personnel uh, concerns uh, on Chartwell's ends is has always been, uh, you know, grounds to just exclude from a search. Um, so. Uh, the, the manager tenure numbers here, at least, these are uh, average of, uh, of a, a group of managers. These are, you know, um, uh, not necessarily one-man shows. Um, and uh, also these managers are, are supported by extensive uh, analyst benches, so, you know, of people who may or may not have even longer tenures than the people who are leading the fund, combined with people who are, you know, new. Well, what would the committee like to do? Is there anyone willing to make a motion for one of the short-term bond managers presented, or do you want more information or additional competitors? What was the uh, driving cause for our current allocation not to perform? Security selection and a little bit of sector allocation Did the as of, well. Of that fund change? No, not yet. Yeah, he's been the same actually since inception. Which is, you know, the ownership of the firm has changed, but the team has remained in place. American Century has done it for a long time, and they, even though they're higher, I, I guess I'll make a motion that we. Select them. I'll second that. All those in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed, aye. vote no. Motion carries for American Century. If I, I'm sorry to backpedal a little bit, but okay. this this opened up a question regarding our um, our uh, uh, real assets. Regarding the inflationary pressures and if commodities serve as a hedge and you say that we're underweighted right now in commodities and commodities have not performed well, going back to your comment about buying low, would this be a time to reallocate some of the equity holding into those commodities? Yeah, we have, um, during the past year, we did increase a little bit to uh, natural resources. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we could do more. <clears throat> Certainly. It's also growing into its allocation. And real estate is also a good yeah. inflation hedge. Um, and we, sort of for the past year, we have felt that <clears throat> real estate is sort of the better category. But yeah, we can certainly, you know, we look for opportunities to increase the allocation. Um, well, I agree. We've lost the benefit of the fixed income, but you know, the inflation seems to <laughs> inflation and increased interest rates seems to um, uh, be a kind of a, a dual-edged sword out there, I guess, because obviously the interest rates are going to impact the earnings of those large corporations that have performed so well. 
uh, <coughs> and obviously the input costs associated with manufacturing their goods is going to go up with the commodities. So just wondering if commodities wouldn't be a, a good place to look going forward. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And, you know, another um, thing that we can um, also give a, a thought to is that within the commodities um, story, currently you're in um, a commodity ETF that um, invests very heavily in the energy sector and the traditional, if you will, energy sector. There are more diversified real asset funds that are also looking at the transition that's happening in energy. So they're investing in the traditional energy. They're investing in companies that are focusing in on the transition. They're investing in infrastructure, which um, spending on that should go up. <laughs> and they're investing in in um, uh, the updates in agriculture. So it's a more diversified, if you will, real assets play to um, take advantage of being both a good inflation hedge, but also the transition from old to new. So that's something we can, um, we may also bring to your attention. We've been speaking with some of our other clients about that. Thank you. Okay, Michael, you want to move to the small cap value manager search? Or the bonds, yeah. Yeah. I mean bonds. Yep. Yeah, so, um, yeah, for short-term bonds. Um, in that uh, presentation book, I would also um, suggest that you know, for those with physical copies to turn to page three. And so uh, the, the purpose behind this search, which, um, you know, this one is uh, a newer search, uh, is to add a new exposure to the, the plan. Natalka uh, mentioned earlier that your fixed income team, um, the, the shortest duration exposure that you have is a uh, uh, kind of intermediate type um, bond exposure or also your mortgages um, with TCW, total return. Um, we are looking forward at potentially a very uh, difficult environment for interest rates. Um, and because of that, uh, we recommend or we suggest a, uh, an exposure to short-term bonds. Um, the, the returns in this asset class are uh, a lot less compelling than the equity search we just went through. And um, that is certainly saying something given that the equity search was kind of the weakest area of the, uh, the U.S. stock market. That being said, going forward, results in uh, intermediate and longer term fixed income are expected to be um, at best uh, mediocre and at worst painful. Um, so we are, uh, we, we've uh, put together a list here of, of the uh, strongest performing uh, risk on a risk adjusted basis. Um, short-term bond managers, uh, those that we are uh, quite familiar with, uh, some of, of whom we've worked with um, in the past uh, for many years. Um, uh, the list is, uh, you know, starting with uh, BBH Limited Duration, that's uh, uh, a team out of Brown Brothers Harriman, a name that uh, may sound familiar. Um, we have American Century Short Duration, another familiar name given that we just selected another American Century uh, product for small cap value. And we have FPA New Income, a fund with a very long, um, very long track record and a, uh, a very long tenured management team. Each of these funds, they, they are very unique in their approach to the asset class. As a matter of fact, uh, BBH Limited Duration in particular stands out as um, the shortest duration manager of the three options here. They actually fit within uh, what we consider a separate category called ultra short term bonds. Ultra short term bonds are, um, you know, investments with uh, less than a year of uh, until maturity. Um, the way that they uh, maintain this portfolio, though, is not necessarily through purely um, investing in only sub one year duration securities, although that is the majority of the portfolio. They also uh, utilize forward contracts to hedge out, hedge out duration um, via treasuries. Uh, of the three, it is the highest rated in terms of risk and return. Um, and going forward, uh, the, the duration is one of the things you, you, you know, we really targeted. Uh, we, we are looking um, for excess returns via really one thing, and that is um, credit spreads. 
Uh, if I could direct your attention here to the um, the right side of the middle table, you can see the percentages of each of the kind of fixed income sectors that, that each finalist invests in. You notice that they're all very distinct from each other, and they're all very <coughs> distinct from the benchmark. And one thing about fixed income and uh, benchmarking is that because fixed income securities uh, vary uh, much more greatly than you know common stocks, um, that is to say, if Coca-Cola sells a 30-year bond, they sell also a 15-year bond, or you know, they might have overnight paper. Um, those are, they're, they're not homogenous like stocks. So, and supply is limited. So although indices can track you know, the majority or the entirety of the fixed income market, you can invest uh, in the majority or the entirety of the fixed income market all at once because there simply just aren't enough issues to go around. So there are bond index funds. Uh, Natalka and I, uh, we, we don't like them very much um, because they do their best to kind of emulate <laughs> bond index, but they can't, they can't exactly copy it. And that can be problematic. It, it introduces tracking error. So um, again, on this uh, right-hand side of the middle table, you can see BBH limited duration has very little in the way of government securities. Government securities offer nothing in the way of credit spreads for obvious reasons. And um, really the, the returns that they offer are tied to movements and rates. Uh, they are the most heavily rated of the three fi finalists in corporates at 57% of the fund. Um, you know, corporate bonds are, are exactly as you think. They're just the normal kind of senior um, securities, uh, you know, for the most part, they're fixed rate, you know, bonds of, of U.S. corporations. And then they're waiting to securitize product. While uh, lower now, um, relative to how it has been historically, is still higher than the, be than the benchmark. One thing to note about their management team is uh, one of the co-managers uh, actually did uh, their PhD thesis in, um, in exactly that sector of the market. So they have um, extremely good capabilities, not just on the uh, research side, but also on the, um, on the underwriting side and, um, and their relationship uh, with issuers and, uh, and, um, and underwriters as well. American Century, sh uh, short duration. They are the most traditional of the offerings here. Um, as a matter of fact, they are uh, they are the closest in terms of their allocation to the benchmark. At 50% government uh, securities, you know they they are investing really only in um, you know very short term um, uh, issues. But out of the three uh, managers here, they are the longest duration. So past performance is going to look stronger for them, but we expect it to be weaker for them going forward. You know, we've really only seen rates go one direction over the long term, and that's lower. Longer duration, you know, vehicles are going to perform better in, a, in an environment of falling rates. We don't foresee that coming up, so we do uh, view that as an area uh, to pay attention to. FPA New Income, um, they pretty much always have, uh, and, we, and we know them to be uh, one of the highest weighted in uh, securitized products. Um, they actually are. Uh, they actually have a very low standard deviation. Um, they they have kind of a, a, a middling. They 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 are right in the middle in terms of effective duration, but within the realm of you know pure short term bond managers, without stepping into the ultra short category, they're always on the shorter end, and that is by virtue of uh, of their heavy weighting to securitize products. Most of, you know, when you think of securitized, think of mortgages, think of, uh, you know, asset-backed equipment finance, um, you know, uh, CLOs, as Natalka mentioned before, so, you know, business loans um, securitized in the same way that mortgage-backed securities are. Uh, their manager, uh, Thomas Atterbury, is actually set to retire soon, but his, uh, his Co-manager has uh, long been been seen as his successor and has has uh, you know been been in line for this for for many years since at least 2014. And um, one of the uh, one of the things about FPA new income is the they very rarely exhibit um, a negative quarterly return. Um, 
As a matter of fact, Natalka, is it is it one or zero quarterly negative returns, or is it? Even I think it's annual. And oh, annual returns. Annual. That return. They have never had They've a negative. Never had return. an annual re a negative annual return since inception. And oh. Since inception. And what, which money are we talking about? This for which money? Just cash. It could be a bit of your cash, and um, it, we could uh, potentially shift some of Pinnacle or TCW, oh, the no intermediate money, sort of shifting it uh, to a shorter duration. So, and what do we get on our cash now? One tenth, two tenth. Exactly. Okay. But that may change next year if the Fed yeah. begins hiking rates. So, yeah. you know, uh, all of a sudden money markets might. Yeah. You know, so. So we may gain twenty basis points or thirty basis points. Right. Quickly there. Right. Yeah. So. This is really, you know, um, would be used as, uh, you know, just to shorten duration um, and, you know, doing a little bit of trimming of the longer duration managers. And in the short term, you know, potentially putting some of that excess liquidity, you know, uh, into something that might earn a little bit more than money market, but not be in a position to like really lose money. Yeah. So it bothers me a little bit that American Century has fifty percent of their portfolio in government bonds and still only get a triple B rating. The other fifty percent must be down there in the basement. <laughs> right? You're, that is very accurate. Yeah. I'd say yeah. It's called barbelling, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you know, when things get tough, those bonds get bad. So go bad. Yes. Yeah, that that is really applicable. Um, you know, very much most to them out of these finalists, but really to all of the um, the short term and ultra short term uh, kind of bond categories for the finalists here and the ones we passed over. Um, there's really uh, there uh, going forward. Um, you know, not just Chartwell, but really majority of the managers that we speak to, they, they can see one way to, uh, to provide alpha, and that is through uh, credit spreads, you know, through, through investing in spread products, whether it be securitized or corporate bonds. That, that seems to be, you know, almost unanimous out there. Bounce off Earl's comment. Where does Chartwell think we are in the business cycle? In the business cycle? Mm -hmm. And where will well, we be in the next six to 12 months? You want to go first or me? You, you can go first. Well, you see, you're anxious. <laughs> I, um, I'm, I'm you know, kind of known around the office uh, to be the bull. Um, that said, I don't necessarily give, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not willing to call the, uh, the downturn that we saw or the, you know, the recession that we saw in 2020, I'm not really willing to call that kind of the start of a new cycle. I think that we've kind of recovered back to where we were and, um, you know, I'm, I'm just because of how, how brief it was, I, I, would, I would call it, you know, more of a hiccup than an actual restart of a new cycle. Um, you know, technically by traditional definitions, you can say that we had a recession. You can also say that we exited that recession, and thus we are, you know, kind of on our way again. Um, but 2020 was no 2008, um, and we, uh, you know, the the recession was kind of um, imposed, uh, you know, uh, via policy and not through kind of a natural uh, overextension of, you know, perhaps uh, credit. Um, I think that we. You know, depending on, on how things shake out now with where inflation is and how uh, tight spreads are going. We, one, one measure to look at is uh, investment grade and high yield uh, corporate credit spreads. We've been trending near uh, lower bounds, but we have not gotten down to quite the levels of pre-2008. I think we have, you know, maybe another sixth of a way to go until we actually start touching or exceeding those lower bounds. So, you know, they're, they're, there, I think there's some juice left. I don't think it's necessarily time to go, you know, crazy with risk. But I do think that, um, you know, those who can take, um, you know, prudent 
calculated risks in the areas of the market which you know actually present opportunities that is to say you know outside of the very highly and optimistically valued uh, growth companies uh, you know namely perhaps electric vehicles and things like that with uh, you know a thousand times uh, PEs and things of that nature or no earnings um, I think though you know I think your small cap values, your real estates, your commodities, your, your things like that may be due for a second wind like we saw at the beginning of this year. Uh, I've always kind of felt like the, the recession created by COVID was, was a pause in the, in the expansionary cycle that we I were fully in, agree. which makes that now by a number of years the longest expansionary cycle we've had. Yes, sir. Yes. So just historically speaking, it seems like we're ready for a backup. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why I was curious about the business cycle and the exposure both of the top two choices have to corporates right. and whether the, the change in business cycle in that six to 12 months would, would cause the value of those bonds to go down because of their exposure to corporates. Right. And, and you know, to that, I, I, I certainly agree with the sentiment. And um, it is, you know, it is quite unusual the length of this, this credit cycle. Um, although, you know, uh, bull markets, they, you know, uh, kind of a, a platitude that we have is, you know, bull markets, they don't die of old age. You know, it's, it's well, very just slow. decided to put 1.6 trillion back into the economy this past week, so that's a lot of money that's going to flow in. Yes, sir. It'll yep. be hard to have a down cycle when you got cash flowing like that. Yeah. No, I think that um, also... Um, from the bond managers that we're talking to, one of the questions that I ask is, you know, I think we can't rely on a whole lot more of spread compression because spreads are near, you know, as tight as they've ever been. A little bit more to go, as Michael said. But, you know, ha you know so where is, the, you know, where's the juice going to come from for high yield and investment grade? And managers like PIMCO, like Western, like TCW, um, will say spreads can stay tight for a long time and the market can keep going. High yield companies are in really good financial shape. Defaults are below 2%. They're not anticipated to go much higher than 2% in 22. Um, so they're saying, you know, it can stay this way for a while and they'll just grind out slightly higher returns because of coupon and, and such. Inflation does scare everybody a little bit. I mean, that is something that could derail, you know, or slow down economic growth. But, you know, we're, we're, the, the Fed is trying to dance on the head of a pin and control inflation and, you know, job growth and interest rates and, and, you know. I know we have that inflation, but I think that's also a supply chain issue. I think that's also a COVID issue. Yep. And I think as some of those issues are solved, you Correct. may see that inflation subside a little bit and it might surprise everyone. Yeah. I mean, and that's why we're, we're not telling you to back off of your equity allocations. Yes. We're not telling you to even rebalance back to target because we're a little bit more nervous about fixed income and the opportunities there. So. Yeah. For my money, we should table this and look at it later. I think this is a decision over 1% on whatever low percentage of our portfolio it means that I don't think makes a whole lot of difference, and we're spending a lot of time on it. Okay. No, I mean, that's, that's just my opinion. That's your motion? Is that your motion? I don't no, that's not a motion. That's my opinion. <laughs> I seldom put my opinions out as a motion. <laughs> you notice. <laughs> well, just like, you know, we brought high yield bonds and U.S. real estate and, you know, other ideas um, to your attention for what we, you know, um, we wanted to at least bring up you know, the duration issue, that we're watching it, that we're concerned about it, um, and this is an alternative. But it could also be a problem that is solved next year if the Fed starts 
raising interest rates, yes. and all of a sudden on money market you're earning a little bit, and you may be earning as much as you're earning with a two-year bond. Exactly. But, so, and we may not be able to get out of that two-year bond without a bit of a loss. Right. On so, the other side, the, the intermediate and long-term allocations will suffer if they start raising the rates. They will. But as I said, well, you take are, it back to cash. You're at intermediate, and you're at the you're at the shorter end of intermediate. Okay. Pinnacle tends to run underweight duration in the intermediate mandate, and the mortgage-backed um, portfolio is also shorter duration. You know, it's a it's a retirement plan, and you know. A, Michael knows that probably a lot of his clients have long-term bonds to match off against your liabilities. We've never recommended that for you. Um, we felt that perhaps you know uh, growing your assets was a bit more important, and you know perhaps if your funded ratio ever got you know 95 or above. You know, let's lock in some of those gains with long-term bonds. But yeah, I think the next year or two, I think that longer-term bonds are going to have a rougher road. Why don't we just make a motion to table it, since you won't do it? <laughs> well, I'm not. I'm only one vote. That no, mean I know, but you can. I'll second Charlie's motion. Okay. 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 So we have a motion to table the decision on a short-term bond manager to the future to see how things look. We'll, um, we'll, we'll keep an eye on it and, and we'll also um, look at commodities and also maybe a diversified real asset fund okay. as well for your consideration. Thank you for your time All and attention. All those in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Vote no. Okay, motion carries. All right, Michael, you're up with uh, the Finley Review, the July 1st, 2021 actuarial valuation and report, as well as the Gatsby Statement 68 for the audit report. Thank you. Uh, and welcome, Kathy. Uh, this will be your probably your first presentation from Actuary, so <laughs> don't hesitate to ask this question. It's, it's a new area for you. Uh, you know, assets, you know something about assets because you've got, you've got assets in your, in your retirement plans that you have, and so uh, this may be a little new area for you. Uh, and we're happy to be here and appreciate working with the city all, all these years. Uh, so we're going to start off, I'm just going to go on and uh, you see our agenda on, on, the, on the slide there on, on page one. Uh, we're going to talk about the valuation, what is an actual valuation, the results, the assumptions, talk about pension risk and, 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 and GASB 68 results. And we'll go, go ahead and move into what, what is an actual valuation. And uh, basically, just like on your financial statement, you go out and have an auditor review it, uh, and, you, and you do your financial statements annually. Same thing with a pension plan. Uh, you want to measure the plan's financial uh, position on a specific date, and that's based on plan provision, participants, plan assets, and the actual assumptions and funding method. If you change any one of these four components, you'll get a different results uh, on your liabilities that are calculated through the valuation system. So basically, we use a funding method that provides a systematic approach to fund the benefits underneath the plan. Uh, we're using the interest rate normal funding method with the unfunded accrued liability amortized over 40 years starting in 2001. This is in accordance with this. The state came out with rules several years ago and we're, and we're following the funding policy that the committee and the, and the city elected to, to follow going forward. Ultimately, the cost of a plan to the city is the benefits that you paid out, less employee contribution, less investment income. And it's always great to have the your investment advisor and actuary in room because you see the value of us together, working together uh, with your asset allocation to get the returns you want. I you mean, know, they talk, talk about, you know, some plans use long-term bonds and that's when they're really in, in nine year above, they start looking at long-term bonds to lock in that gain because your, your liability goes up and down based on interest rates in the marketplace. So that's why a lot of people do that going forward. And then we, 
Uh, I, I apologize to Kathy. We used to put in a section on the plan provisions, but since the committee was so familiar with it, we decided we'd take it out of the report. But you're a participant in the plan, so you probably have a little understanding how that works. So uh, we might, might want to add it back in next year just to kind of hit the highlights there. But you know, the plan is closed. Uh, basically, the formula is 2% uh, times years of service up to 30 years. Uh, retirement age is uh, 65. I won't get all these right because they're all different. Uh, for general employees, it's 65 or 62 and 30 years. 62 and 20. 20. 62 and 20. And then the foreign police is fit age 55 in that. So going forward. Okay. Uh, the key actual assumptions. Back in 2018, we did a uh, experience study and looked and reviewed all the assumptions underneath your, your funding policy that you uh, that the city sign off on. Uh, every five years you're supposed to review your assumptions. We also look at them every year just to see if anything's going the wrong direction. Uh, but so far everything seems well. Uh, investment return is 7%. Natalka in her presentation you saw over the long term, over uh, I think it was after five to ten years, it was over, uh, right around 8%. So that makes us feel good. We know you're going to have some deviation in, in, in one year or another year. I think last year was not a good year right after COVID hit. Uh, but, uh, you know, this year was a great year. This has been a great year to go out and see my clients that had a June 7-1 uh, valuation date because the returns have been, you know, 20%, 19%. Uh, I walked into one and said, well, looking at your asset allocation, looking at capital markets, those are the smart investment people that say, well, we think the return in the next 20 years are only going to be 5% or 6% based on this portfolio. I said, I have a hard time walking in there recommending you to drop your 7% return down to 6.75 when you just got a 20% return. I said, we'll watch it next year and see what happens. You know, so uh, uh, I didn't want anybody to run me out of town when I made those presentations. Uh, salary, uh, salary increase assumptions, uh, 4%. That was kind of based on our study, what, what has been going on historically here. We'll, we'll manage and watch that. And a, uh, a few more slides. We'll make some comments. Uh, you were slightly under that uh, increase this past year. Remember, this you got employees now who are 30 or, or 40 years old, so they're going to continue to earn compensation in the future. So it's a long term uh, return on what the uh, yeah, salary increases will be so we don't want to just jump in there and change it. Well, we gave 10% raises last year. Well, maybe we should increase. I said no. It's long term. It's going to be the average over the next 20 or 30 years. And of course, we do have that uh, scary thing of inflation popping in here, where we may see salaries increase in in the future. We'll just have to monitor that as well. Uh, we're using a, a very standard table uh, that was published recently. Uh, the uh, RP 2014 combined mortality table. And every year, uh, Society of Actuaries come out and produces a new mortality improvement scale, which we reflect in the mortality going forward. Withdrawal rates are just the, the uh, was based on most recent experience, just the probability of when somebody might leave, like an employee, when they're going to terminate employment. And then retirement rates are a little different, and we'll go through those in just a minute. Uh, plan expenses, we just have it set equal to uh, prior, the prior year's expenses. Uh, we do that because you have to recognize you're taking expenses out of the trust fund. You started that a few years ago and we have to recognize that in coming up with the cost to the plan. To the plan. Withdrawal rates, I'll just hit these uh, quickly, just kind of give you an example. Uh, we're using service, we, based on various studies, service has been a, a, a better uh, measure of when people are going to leave than age. It used to be, age used to be very popular in the past, but over time they realized that service uh, seems to be better and fits better for the city as well. For instance, if somebody has 10 to 15 years of service, we assume that 2.5% of your employees would, would terminate during that time period, you know, or, uh, during, that, th during those years of service. Going to the next page, you see retirement rates. And, and these are trigger on, on, on several things. Uh, for like the foreign police, we, we have a very high 20% will leave at age 55 because they can get full retirement at age 55. Uh, we do know that not every one of them retire exactly at 55, so we build up the rates. And you see on the foreign police, we assume basically 100% of them will be gone by age 65. Uh, that's, that's an assumption. Of course, you always may have some outliers. Uh, same thing with the city. Uh, we looked at uh, you know, a lot of people uh, uh, will leave when they get to age 55, there's an early retirement uh, provision in the plan, so about 12.5% we assume will leave. Uh, and then we see as you get on down there between 67 and 69, as the Social Security retirement age keeps creeping up, 
and it's going to reach 67, and, you, uh, and even in 65, 66, you see those rates are 25 to 30 percent where people will start uh, retiring. And then we have 100% at 70. I do know you have one, one or two employees, and I think you have one employee about oh, way over 70, about 76 years old, who's still working. Uh, he must really like working. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, going on the next page, we talk about the asset valuation method. We use a smoothing method, and that's so that you know when we do the valuation, if if we have like the market happened last year, it dropped way down. Uh, you know we would have volatility in your contribution, so we kind of smooth that out. And uh, and so we recognize only you know five percent in the gains and losses. And this year you can really see on the next tab, we, we have a graph here. The the blue line is the actual asset value. You see that line is very very. Uh, Pretty straight going to the time period of what's going on there. And, and then you see the orange line is at the, the market value. You see that's much more volatile than the other. And you see right at the tail at 2021, you know, you had a great return this past year. Uh, I'm going to say on the market value basis, probably close to 19 or 20 per percent at, at, as of 630. Uh, and, and you see that's why that orange line is so much longer because we're not recognizing all that gain. Uh, so the blue line is, a little, is shorter down. They're only recognizing 20% of that large gain that you had uh, this past year and in, in, in conjunction with the other gains and losses we had before. Uh, you see your asset returns, it's, it's pretty volatile on both the uh, actual asset value and the market value return. Uh, one interesting thing, it's, it's interesting, the orange line kind of seems to be in between. It's not the highest, it's not the lowest to that time period. So that's where you see that smoothing technique going through uh, on the return there. Any questions so far? Page 11 is just a quick historical summary of some of the key things. We talked about earlier that the plane is closed. You had over, uh, in 7 2019, you had 563. Uh, active employees in the plan. You see how that has dropped down as of 7-121 to 491 uh, participants. It covered payroll. Of course, as your population go down, your cover payroll uh, will go down as well, even though people are getting increases. Now, your average salary, you see, has continued to increase. Uh, the average age, as we anticipate, uh, for your active employees would continue to grow up uh, about uh, you know, one year each 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 year that we increase. Uh, average uh, past service is gradually going is increasing as you see about one per year. You have retired participants. You started out with 296 in, in 2019. That continues to grow as actives terminate. They either go to a, a retired participant or become a deferred vested. Uh, deferred vested are those employees who have ceased being active employees but they're not drawing benefits yet. So uh, that's what that category is. And you have quite a few out there right now, 284. Uh, those people probably left, got another job, and when they get to 65, they'll uh, notify HR here and say, yes, we want to start our drawing our pension out. And, uh, and they'll be happy that they're gonna get that guaranteed monthly check from the city for as long as they live. Uh, on page 12, you see the present value of benefits. Uh, this is based on all the plan, the plan provisions, the participants in the plan. We look at the expected benefit payments out in the future, discount them back with, uh, with the interest rate that we assume, the 7%. And you see that, you know, as we anticipate, the present value is going to grow because as people get closer and closer to retirement, that group of, re uh, of actives, uh, their present value of paying out is, is closer. So that's why you see that, that increase there going forward. On page 13, it's just the historical uh, funding ratio. That's the, the blue line you see through there. And, and the city has done a great job. I'm happy to see, you know, it's all, always been above 80%. Uh, at one point, it hit as high as, it looks like in the uh, close to 90%. Uh, and that's what you want to see. You want to see, see yourself above 80%. There's not really a, what is the best funding ratio to have? But it's a much better than what they have in the state of Kentucky and, and in, in the schools in Chicago system, where it's like 20%. Uh, they're going to have some very uh, tough issues to, 
uh, to face in the future uh, how they're going to pay people out when you have a 20% ratio. You're going to run out of assets at some point. So uh, people are leaving Illinois to move other places because they know their taxes are going to go up to pay for those benefits in the future. Uh, but you can see, you see the blue line is the uh, interage past service liability, the liability, and the, and the orange or yellow is the actual asset value going forward. On page 14, you see the unfunded accrued liability. The, unfunded, the accrued liability is just the liability of the benefits that have been earned to date. And you see there's $190.8 million. The actual asset value, remember this is a smooth value, is $162.5 million for an unfunded of a 28.24. At the beginning of my presentation, I said that we were amortizing in over 40 years beginning in, in 2001. There's 20 years remaining, uh, so I, amortizing the 28.2 million over 20 years is 2.4 million dollars. And that comes into play on the next page where you come up with your actuarially determined contribution rate for the 2022-2023 fiscal year. We do the valuation as of 7-1-2021 and the city funds it in the following fiscal year so you can work into your budget going forward. Uh, as, you talked about, uh, as I said previously, it's a 20-year amortization, so you have the amortization unfunded liability. That's one component of 2.4 million. You add in your normal costs. That's the uh, liabilities of the active participants that are occurring during during the plan year. You have your plan expenses. We have the assumed interest of $190,000. So you have a total annual funding level of $5.7 million, or 17.66% based on a total payroll of 32.4 million. Now the, now the city contributes based on the 17.66%, uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and that would be the rate they use towards the payroll and funding, and that satisfies the uh, actual determined contribution requirement that the state requires going forward. On the next page is the annual contribution level for the fiscal year ending uh, each of these years, and you see it's it has constantly been around 12%. It popped up in 2018 when we made some assumption changes, but we want to measure the plan as accurately as we can going forward. And so it's spent, been in the 18-16 uh, range for the last few years. Fortunately, this year we, we saw a decrease. And just to give you on the, the table on page 17, it provides kind of a historical uh, review of the various components and the total of your actual determined con contribution. Uh, it was 4.4 million uh, and it's a uh, dollar amount 5.7. Uh, right now, as I said, you're, you're contributing based on a, on a percentage and that percentage is going up because your population is going down, your contribution, but as a dollar amount, you see actually your, uh, it's been pretty constant. Uh, uh, 2019 forward uh, between between 5.5 and 5.7 uh, million dollars in contribution. Eventually, you may change your definition of ADC just to be a dollar amount instead of percent of payroll, because uh, eventually you're going to get down to where you only have 20 and 30 employees, and you're going to say well, our contribution rate is 240 uh, <laughs> percent. Know, so, something to take uh, uh, in the future. We may be changing that. Uh, just some things uh, for the ADC, actual determined contribution, uh, is 17.66%. That's the, the percentage that you apply to your payroll of your active participants in the plan that you will contribute during that physical year. That is a 1.07% decrease from the prior year. A lot of that has to do with your uh, return on assets, even though we only recognize 20%, but as over that time period, you've done well over that five years that we do the smoothing. Uh, I talked earlier about the salary increases were a little bit lower than expected in the prior year, which decreased the ADC by 0.01%. The actual asset return, and this is on the actual asset basis, not the market value basis, 9.38%, we're assuming 7%. And that decreased the ADC by 1.7. Uh, other demographic change, uh, gains decreased the ADC by 0.43%. Uh, demographic gains would be people re retiring earlier than we anticipate or later, uh, change in pay, uh, things of that nature uh, going forward. 
this. Any questions on the evaluation results so far? We've added this year this new slide. Uh, I thought it was important to kind of show you the expected benefit payments. Uh, at the bottom you see that the, the red is the inactives uh, and those are your retirees, your uh, terminated vesteds. And you see that's the high percentage. You look at 2021, that's the most all we anticipate all your payments are going to be from that group. You may have a few, we anticipate a few retirees from the uh, fire and police and general employees. And you see that orange, uh, that, that red line, you, that, that bar you get out there and it basically disappears when you get out there in 2020, 96 or something. And then you see the blue and the orange are the uh, active employees, the fire and police and the uh, general employees. And you see, your expected benefit payments are going to peak somewhere around 2043 and then they're going to start going down because uh, you have a closed population and by 2087 you know, almost be, almost everybody's going to be paid out by that time. It trails out a little bit longer. You can see some dots there but you may have a few people that will live longer but you know your average age of your active participants are I think we said it was around 50 if I remember a couple slides back. And so when they retire, you look at them, you know, they could live to 100, so, you know, they could be further out there. And, you know, they have spouses as well that may be younger. And you may have some terminated people who, who could be younger going forward. But that's just kind of to show you, that's what you're trying to fund. You're really trying to fund these series of these benefit payments over the life plan. That's what the assets are doing uh, going forward. Now, once you probably get to the peak at one point, and I've talked about this in the past, you know, you may go to LDI that we talked about, liability-driven investments, where you say, okay, we know what our liabilities are, we know what the payments are, so you do a, a bond matching to the expected uh, uh, payments, and, and that's something, you know, but that's further down the road. I, I think the approach you take, you need to build up some, you needed the growth now to get your assets to that point to where you could do that, maybe 20 or 30 years from now. Uh, you may, may want to look at that. Also, if the annuity rates market if those rates go up, as the interest rates go up, the annuity rates will go up. And as the annuity rates go up, the cost to buy annuities are cheaper. So here again, you might want to de-risk your plan and maybe look at buying annuities at some point. And of course, historically the rates have been so low, uh, annuities have not been the, the, the best way to go right now. So uh, going forward. All right, uh, Matt and I are going to talk, we'll let Matt talk a little bit about the pension risk here and go forward. Matt. All right, thank you. Um, so the risks to your pension plans, uh, ongoing risks, uh, one is your interest rate risk. Currently, we don't see that as a big risk. We're set at 7%. Um, as, we, as we heard earlier, the annual 10-year return has been 8%. Um, but we set that risk rate, that interest rate, ri that interest rate at um, a mix between historical and forward-looking. Um, Michael mentioned this briefly, but the capital market assumptions from uh, multiple financial uh, advisors has said that that's a little bit lower than 7%. So averaging those out, 7% is reasonable. So I don't see the interest rate risk being a big deal. But if we were to come back and, and change that interest rate assumption and lower that, that would increase your liabilities. Um, so there's a, there's a risk there. Uh, the contribution risk is currently based on your percentage of payroll. Uh, Michael mentioned briefly also that as your active participants um, start terminating, that, that payroll for the active participants in the plan is going to decrease and that percentage is expected to increase as the plan is, is maturing. Um, so we might want to talk at some point about changing how we do the contribution a little bit further down the road. Uh, <clears throat> longevity risk, that's risk of people living longer and taking more benefits um, than our current assumptions. Uh, we think our current assumptions are good. We set our, our mortality table based on a standard mortality table and we, we have an improvement scale that we update annually, which is the most recent. Um, currently your, your inactive liability makes up 46% of your, your total. So those retirees that are currently uh, taking their benefits is not over 50 percent where we would we would start thinking maybe there there'd be an issue there but I, I don't think there's much in the the longevity risk that you have to worry about at the moment um, demographic risk that would be differences in participants taking their uh, terminating early um, or retiring early 
uh, or, or something along with that, or late, something along with that, where their uh, actual experience is different than what we assumed. And so anytime there's that mismatch, there's, there's potential for a difference each year, a gain or loss each year, uh, from the difference in, in our assumptions and, and what the plan experienced. That might be a little higher this year with COVID. I don't know if, um, if you've seen more terminations or retirees. I know we've seen that with other clients uh, where there have been more terminations and retirees with COVID. Um, but our last experience study was done in 2018. Uh, generally, we update those studies based on your actual experience every five years. So I think in 2023 would probably be when we need to discuss um, updating that again. But it's possible you might see some more demographic risk this year with COVID um, just based on that. Are there any questions on the, the funding results or, or your risks? I'll move into the GASB 68 then. Um, GASB 68 is used for your accounting purposes. It's what's um, put in your accounting, your accounting books. Uh, it's not what is used to determine your actual determined contribution, which is actually uh, the money that comes out of the, the city to fund the pension. Um, so it's slightly different than that. And also, it's also based on the interest age normal funding method. Um, but it's slightly different. It'll be slightly different than funding funding that we saw earlier because it um, it, it also has th there's no smoothing of the assets. So it's it's using the market value of the assets instead of smoothing the assets. So you see slightly different numbers here than than were shown earlier. Uh, also, the valuation date is a year. It lags a year. So there's one year difference between what we've got here and what we've seen in the funding. But the reporting date is still the same, 6-30-2021. Some terminology. There's the plan fiduciary net position. That is your market value of assets um, for 6-30. And this is lagging a year. We had uh, 140.5 million. Then there's your pension liability, um, which also lags a year. So we're, you know, both of these numbers are reported at 6-30-2021, but they're actually calculated at the year before. Um, so for this, uh, the liability was 18.4 million. And then the total, the net pension liability, which is the total of the market value, the, the liabilities minus the market value is uh, 43.7 million. Now, I'll ask them, the reason we do that lag is because in order for the city to have, get their financial statements done on a timely basis, they need the numbers a lot earlier. So that's why we use the, the data from the year before, which is allowed by GASB 68. Uh, because when, when Melissa was running the show here in the finance department, you know, she needed numbers before uh, November. <laughs> <laughs> to get all, all the financial statements completed. So uh, that's many, many entities do that. The government entities do that on age 68. Thank you, Matt. Um, here we show the sensitivity. This is a sensitivity to interest rates, uh, something what we were talking about earlier with um, your risk. If your interest rate decreases, then that's going to increase your, your net pension liability, your, unfu your unfunded liability. Um, so one percentage change uh, down is going to increase that, that liability uh, by about 24 million. And then a, uh, if we go the other way, if we go 1% increase, then it's gonna decrease your, your liability by about 20 million. And that's about the only good news with rising interest rates for a pension. <laughs> right. okay. Yeah. There's yep. not much good news, but that's the good news. Yep. And, and fortunately, you know, we get to keep, we get to set the interest rates and, and we set it and keep it stable as far as we can. Uh, we recently changed it in 2018 um, due, to, due to market conditions. Um, but we can set it and we can leave it alone until we see a need to change it again. Um, and currently we don't, we don't see a need to change it. Uh, here are the numbers for the change in liability year over year. Uh, the, the prior year reporting had 17.9 million, whereas the current year had the 18.4 million, that, that final balance. And then uh, in between, you've got all your changes uh, that happened through the year. The service costs, that's your, your participant accruals throughout the year, 2.8 million. Then you had interest on the liability, about 12.5 million. Um, your experience gain or loss, that is from actual differences between our assumptions, um, like termination and retirement. Uh, and that had a gain of 4 million. 
And then the benefit payments that came out uh, reduced the liabilities about 6.5 million to get the total change of 4.8 million there. And the next page shows the change in the assets year over year. We've got the uh, prior year reporting of, uh, of 144.1 million, and they had the contributions of 5.4 million. The expected return of 7% was 10 million. Um, and in this year, and this is looking, again, this is looking back kind of um, one year prior, so going from, from 630.19 to 630.2020, um, there was a, a the decrease from COVID there, and so we had um, negative returns, and so there was some loss in that period, and then the benefit payments and the expenses get your net your net decrease of your assets during that period of 3.6 million to get to the the 114.5 million uh, at the end of the year, and so next year we'll see this again, but we we know what the the final balance is, you know, um, from what what we'd seen earlier, it's going to increase. Uh, so, so next year this will be this will look a lot better. And then the change in the total net pension liability, which is the unfunded amount uh, from year over year, is is the change in the um, the liability and the change in the assets from the prior two pages. Uh, so we went from 13.5 to, or, or sorry, uh, 35.2 to uh, 43.8 there. Um, also, with your accounting, you have to recognize um, the pension expense, which has several components. The first component being the service costs, that's the accruals of the participant accruals for the year, the active participants as their pay changes and they get another year of service. Um, that will increase the liabilities. And then there's the interest cost, um, the interest on the, the pension liabilities. Um, and then you can you can offset that by your projected investment earnings. So our seven percent assumed projected investment earnings um, that will decrease it. And then you've got your amortized um, unfunded um, experience gains or losses. Sorry, your, your amortized experience gains or losses, and that's over the the future working lifetime. <coughs> And then any amortization of beneficial or, or negative investment income uh, is amortized over five years. Um, so any gains or losses from experience or investment aren't recognized immediately. Those are both amortized uh, in this portion. And then we add the, the expense cost as well. Mm -hmm. So the next page shows the, ch the actual pension expense, which was 11 million for the year, uh, which has the components, as we, we mentioned earlier uh, in the prior slide, the service cost being 2.8 million, the interest being 12.5 million, um, the expected return decreasing that by about 10 million, and then the recognition of uh, current year gains or losses being uh, being recognized. Um, you've got some demographic gains of about 0.8 million, uh, investment um, losses there about 2.4 million. And then um, the recognition of deferred inflows and outflows uh, that follows. Then you get your economic demographic gains or losses there. Uh, had losses in, in this year of uh, 1 million. And then investment losses about 1.5 million. And then assumption changes of about 1 million uh, to get the total with the, with the expenses there, small expenses. Um, and then finally, we've got uh, the schedule of contributions. You can see your contributions year over year. There's the top line is the actual or the turbine contributions. And then the next one is the uh, contributions that actually happened. Um, generally, we would, we would expect those to be equal. Uh, but in a few years, we had it a little bit over. Um, but these are, these are calculated based on the funding numbers. And they're also shown in the GASB report. Okay, thank you, Michael and Matthew. Uh, the city appreciates the work you have done for us over the many years that we've worked together, and we appreciate the information that you give us, not only for the audit information, but for the committee to use as they have to set assumptions and all this is very valuable, and we appreciate y'all. Melissa, uh, no, thank you for that, and uh, I did want to share with the committee, uh, it's been a long road, but I am going to retire next month and Matt's going to take over and Matt uh, has very been very involved with your plan and he was very 
instrumental in the uh, uh, and the calculation system that they use for calculating your benefits. Uh, also, uh, very instrumental in the study we did a couple years ago on your uh, on your assumptions. So I think you're going to be in good hands. Uh, and, uh, but I have really enjoyed working with this committee and the city. It's been great, and uh, I think you're in good hands. Uh, you know, Nataka has done a good job. Y'all have made some great decisions going for, uh, on your assets and. Things I, I remember going through the transition and closing the plan. That was a challenging time, and and then Gasby came in and changed all the rules there. But we got through it all, didn't we, Melissa? We did. All right, did. so <laughs> it's been great. Well, we appreciate your leadership. You've been you've been wonderful to work with. And Matthew, I know you've been on all the emails, so <laughs> I, I know you're up to date and up to speed. And we look forward to working with you too. All right. Yeah. Thank you. If you have anything, just let me know. Okay. Um, I'll note that uh, Chris gave you all the State of Tennessee Compliance Letter regarding our plan. They evaluate it every year and, and we pass with flying colors as usual. Um, barring any other business, we will adjourn. I know Sean's got another meeting to get to. <laughs> We're adjourned. <laughs>